I just have that on the Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe. Uh,
Uh, we have a quorum. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Strategy Planning and Partnerships Committee, Tuesday, 5th of July. Uh, I'll just uh, Strategy Planning and Partnerships Committee and the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee public meetings will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any or all contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. The Strategy, Planning and Partnerships Committee acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to Elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural, heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge their continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. Uh, item number two, apologies and leave of absence. We have uh, on leave Councillor Antic, we have um, Councillor Abiad who is put in an apology due to illness and I believe we have a couple of members on their way. Uh, can I call for confirmation of minutes from the 7th of June and the 22nd of June, moved by Councillor Martin, seconded by, come on people, someone, Councillor Corbell. Members, I will put that. All those in favour, declare that carried. Members, we have, uh, we have no uh, public forum this evening. I have no verbal report. Um, what I'm going to do is under item 6, I'm going to call for items for adoption on block. If we have a number of items pulled out, I'm going to leave the uh, yeah, in confidence workshop at where it is. If there isn't, I'm just going to move that to a bit later down the agenda, if that makes sense, because we do have um, a, a guest here to present in that workshop. So members, I'll call for items for adoption on block. Uh, item number eight is a workshop. Item number nine is a workshop. Item number ten, Councillor Martin. Item number eleven, Councillor Martin. Item number twelve, Councillor Martin. <laughs> Item number uh, 14, Councillor Farrahan. She leaves me nothing to work with, am I correct? <laughs> okay, then members, we are going to do the workshop um, uh, item uh, <coughs> 8, so I'm going to call for someone to move exclusion, item number 7. Councillor Martin seconded by Councillor Corbell. All those in favour? Can you please vote, members? Sorry. Lord Mayor? Anyone against? Declare that carried. So I'm now going to ask uh, anyone from the public or staff that are not associated with this workshop to please leave the room. <coughs>
I'll reopen the meeting to the public. Why was that that. Can we take that offline? And I asked the question. And, um, all right thank you uh members um i'm actually going to seek a german for this meeting I could have someone read an adjournment from Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor Clarehan. All those in favour? Members, can I have your attention please? All those in favour? Thank you. I'm just going to hand over to Councillor Wilkinson. Yes, as Chair of the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee, I um, open the meeting and call for an adjournment. Councillor Clarehan, seconded by all those in favour? Nothing as me. As opposed? Uh, I know. Um, adjourn the meeting. Hand back to you. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to reopen the uh, Strategic Planning and Partnerships Committee. Uh, we now move to item number nine. Rick Hutchins, oh, welcome. Um, uh, we have a presentation workshop on the Main Street Historic Building Facade Improvement Scheme. Over to you, Rick. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. And with me is Simon Wiedenhofer, our senior heritage architect, who can uh, assist and answer questions. Um, now, so the purpose of this workshop is to seek members' feedback, particularly in relation and in response to a, a decision of council a while ago around investigating some alternative options, particularly in relation to securing council's investment. Um, and funds into projects and alternatives to land management agreements. So if I could jump right in, I might jump, ask Carly or Amy to move forward to, to page four of the notes. And it's a shame that members have had a chance to read, read these, so I will work through it quickly and then enable that discussion to occur. <coughs> Sorry, and page five. Yeah. So just, just briefly, some history on the scheme. The scheme was endorsed by council um, to commence in 2011 um, with the aim to seek the reinstatement of historic building facades, um, particularly in, in, in Main Street areas. Um, it is, um, I guess, does provide the opportunity for substantial grants to building owners up to $250,000 for an individual grant, um, with those grants being approved by council. Um, the scheme has been is extensively promoted, particularly in its early phase. Um, there was some initial interest in the scheme from, from a number of building owners through an ex expression of interest process. Two, two applications did get to the point of receiving an approval for, from council to proceed. Um, those, those schemes in the end did not proceed through to, due to a number of reasons. One of those being um, the feedback from landowners around the impediment of a land management agreement um, on the title being that that is a legal agreement that's in effect binding on the building owner to, to, to retain that building um, for the life of that building. Um, so what I wanted to present tonight is the, the response to looking at, at those alternative um, options, but also through, through the investigations and looking into those options, we do, do want to draw attention to members of some alternative approaches that have been identified. Um, from from schemes that have a similar intent around improving facades and seeking to improve the, the appearance of streets. Two schemes we've identified here, in, one in Newcastle and one in Edmonton, um, a similar intent but do have some differences in terms of being a bit broader in terms of the type of works that they apply to, um, but generally being for a lower, a lower grant amount. Um, so do have some differences in terms of the scheme that Council does currently have. Um, what, is, what is similar to the schemes, they are 
that is very resource intensive and very much a facilitator type outcome. So something to note of being similar in terms of the kind of scheme that council does have. Um, so I guess getting directly into the, the decision of council and, and the matters that council has asked us to investigate, um, the, the options that we've looked at in respect to alternatives to land management agreements, there's, there's two primary options that council asked to look at, one being a lien, one being a loan, both, those both being these different types of legal mechanisms to, to protect um, rate base dollars, if you like. The, the advice we've received is that they're both not appropriate mechanisms to use in this instance. Um, and I can go into those, um, the reasons why, if, if there's a desire to. Um, what has been identified though is an alternative option that, that may be something that council wish to consider and that's generally what we call a grant grant agreement letter so that would be an agreement between an owner of the building and council that would be around reducing payment of debt over a period of time where that would be, would have a time limit on it and then after that time then the agreement would no longer apply there's Looking at an arrangement like that might then bring into some considerations around the scope of the scheme that council may wish to offer, particularly around um, the grant limits as to, I guess, at a point, at what point does it become too excessive to, to go down that type of path. Just generally in summing, summing up in terms of those options, what we have found is that I guess if the outcome is to, to have some form of security to, to retain, to retain security over the ensure the building is preserved. Um, under the current scheme, um, it is difficult to do anything, probably diff would have a different effect as a land management agreement, um, because of, mainly because of the size of the fund that is involved. Um, so I guess that probably takes to discussion around what, what options might council wish to go. Um, that could be revising the scheme to, to have, I guess, still achieve, seek to achieve the same intent, possibly different limits and parameters around the scheme. Um, with that may also be around trying to integrate the delivery of scheme with other, with other actions that council does have in terms of, I guess, some of the, the main street type schemes and ways of delivering the scheme that particularly position it in terms of economic benefits. So I guess I really leave it there and open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you, Rick. Uh, members, we have um, some suggested options and pathways forward in front of us to give the uh, administration some further direction. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's a question through to Rick. Um, is, is there an example of a working model whereby a program like this, should we reinvigorate it? be somehow tied into the governance of our various precincts. Um, is, is there some form of interrelationship there between this program and how we could um, uh, refashion or reimagine our governance models, our community governance models, for our various city precincts throughout the city? Yes, I might take that one if I may through the chair. Um, from what we've looked at with uh, some of the other schemes, they tend to be more economically focused so that it's about improving uh, presentation of the business to customers uh, with, an with the added advantage of improving the general streetscape. None of them were as specific as the particular program the Council had in place. Um, they were also much smaller and in some cases, it was a three-way split between state, council, and the owner for the financing, but much more subsequent. Thanks, Chair. One additional question. The, I recall there was a discussion around this program and whether it was or whether it was not applicable to DDA access to um, character or heritage buildings on our main streets. Um, would you be able to clarify whether, whether this did apply to the improvement of DDA access or that was a separate program? Uh, through the Chair, that was a separate program. This particular uh, scheme was effectively above canopy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, yes, having in 2011 moved Council motion for us to, to do this scheme, um, 
my entire intention of it was to um, see uh, commercial streets improved by basically fi fixing up the ugly ducklings in the street. And when we went through the heritage listing process and started in 2007 after I got elected, ultimately John Rao listed just 14% of the commercial buildings uh, that were recommended by Donovan and Associates. And uh, there were a number of buildings which Donovan and Associates didn't even recommend because they were hidden behind aluminium facades or they'd been modified in the 60s and they'd rendered over the stone and stuff like that. So the whole intention of this was not about activation or DDA access, uh, but it was about seeing these um, once beautiful buildings basically um, uh, brought back to the historic <coughs> that Adelaide is renowned for, but also recognising and the generosity of the scheme at 75% council contribution versus 25% contribution from the private owner, recognised the fact that the owner was agreeing to fix up a building which they could otherwise be allowed to be demolished. Um, and that uh, a lot of commercial property owners have said to me that they get this, they don't rent the upstairs out anyway, and they get all of their rent based on the ground floor, and that rent doesn't change much regardless of what happens upstairs. So. So it's sort of a it's council sort of moving into the space where the, where the private doesn't and they'll just leave the upstairs looking terrible because as long as the shop front and at the moment we've got a shop front improvement scheme but I'd be of the view that commercial owners would fix up their shop fronts on the ground floor without any rate payer money and that's all done completely unsecured so people could just take the money the six thousand dollar grant from council to fix up their shop front and then and then they go out of business or they change hands or they change it in two years time and that six thousand dollars is lost so there doesn't seem to be any concern about securing ratepayers investment for that scheme whatsoever um and just a general fritting up or painting things not pertaining to fixing up the ugly duckling historic buildings it's not really the point of the the scheme um it's it's about um all of the buildings that were brutalised in the 60s and 70s uh, or covered over with aluminium facades. We've had an example in um, uh, Hindley Street, 61 Hindley Street, where uh, Pilates has actually removed the aluminium cladding off that, off that building. He actually did that at my suggestion. He, now, he didn't want to get involved with uh, any contribution from council because he didn't want to be indebted to council. But once a building has been fixed up, the likelihood is that one of the property owner is going to be more on side with retaining the building. Also, the building is more likely to get listed in the future because it won't have been all buggered up or covered up with louvers and things. Um, and uh, so in the future, it's more likely that the building is going to be there for future generations anyway. So, um, I mean, if I was promoting the scheme, I would be getting archival photographs of, of the various buildings and going and meeting with the property owners face to face and also at the same time explaining to them that they still have development potential of their site, they can build towers, set back and, 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 and so to some, allay some of the reasons. Uh, but I'd also be saying to some of these smaller property owners, your site is so small, it's not viable to redevelop anyway, so you may as well improve your assets. At the moment, we've got a lot of property owners just sitting on their buildings, not wanting to spend any money on it, lest it gets heritage listed or, or uh, um, stuff. So there's actually a negative, a negative effect. I mean, if, if all of the buildings that, that had this potential were all listed, we wouldn't need this scheme. But when when the minister's only listed 14% of the buildings they're putting up for listing, and 86% didn't get listed, and that included a whole lot of buildings that, that weren't even recommended, including the one that I just mentioned on Highland Street, which is magnificent, wasn't even recommended. That was among the ones that wasn't recommended because it was hidden behind a facade, um, even though it's all been revealed. So, I mean, I would um, strongly, uh, you know, be of the view that we should be looking to revise the scheme, not amalgamated into some other schemes with nothing to do with, with its original intention. Um, and that, um, you know, if we need more resourcing, you know, to, to assist Simon and his team to be able to um, uh, uh, engage with property owners 
to entice them and sell us game to, to them then uh, which option? 10, 20, or 30 cards? <laughs> Page 40. Well, I think the, 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 the more we can do it, the better. I mean, this, 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 this sort of works has potential to significantly transform buildings. We've seen one building in, in uh, Rundle Mall where they, they were. They were looking at doing the scheme and they did a lot of the work. They took away the ugly box and stuff like that. So it actually had a result and then there the owners didn't end up taking any money from the council. But, but the building nonetheless got significantly improved. Um, so there's a big public benefit from it. And it's it's council acting where the where the private market wouldn't otherwise. Because the private market generally doesn't put value on first floor facades. Um, and just We'd see, we're seeing a tendency in London Mall, for example, of first floor facades that are being seen as a signage, a signage on the So rather than rather than actually improving the buildings to improve the overall appeal of uh, London Mall and Harley Street and Main Streets. Then Lord Mayor Hender. Um, can I just get clarity on exactly what option three, alternative three is? So this means we loan them people some money where we say you can have it for five years, you don't have to pay it back if uh, in five, if you leave the building intact with its renovated front for five years, but if you do something to it between now and then you do have to pay some of it back, is that how it works? Through the chair, that particular model, yes. Um, again, it's a much smaller amount, so the, the value to the public is, is there for that five year period. Uh, and if, if it's changed, you know, if repainted or remodelled, whatever the case may be, within that period, then it's a sliding scale and the remainder is repaid to council. Okay. Well, I support a I support option two, revising the scheme. I think it's worth having a crack at doing that to see if we can get some people to take it up. Same. Alternative three. So, um, can I just get some clarity because uh, normally when we make a decision on a particular option, admin give us a recommendation as a formal process. Um, are you asking actually for? I think uh, you're just, just advising us. The, the intent was to feed back to assist us with preparing a report to come back to committee probably okay. in the next month or two. Mm. Yeah, so we're not seeking a formal decision, just some direction on how members may prefer to go. Yes. Yep. Okay, members. Uh, uh, is there any other speakers to this, Lord Mayor? Um, Simon, just one question. Was it this program which enabled the restoration of that balcony on the corner of Rundle Hall and King William Street three and a half years ago? Um, <coughs> that was done through the uh, Heritage Incentive Scheme, so it was a separate program. Yeah, Lord Mayor, it says here there's been no uptake in this, um, in this scheme for the last four years, so um, I'm guessing that no uh, was the answer. Councillor Clarehan? Yeah. Um, I think, as Councillor Wilkinson outlined, there were opportunities there to take those ugly ducklings and allow them to shine. Uh, those ugly ducklings, my understanding is, weren't eligible for heritage incentive scheme money because they weren't actually heritage listed. So we looked at other ways of actually ensuring that public money was well spent if non-listed property owners access that money and we did that through looking at lean um, what do we call them management something or other land management agreements etc but it didn't result in anyone taking that up and i'm just thinking you know again here's a program that's being administered um, that's taking time, resources, but we're not getting any runs on the board. So either we drop it or we re-look at it to revise it. And I was wondering whether there's the potential for this to fit in with, for example, um, some of our main street master planning. And to me, that would then make a bit more sense where there was a bit more guidance to property owners as, and buy-in as to what um, outcome uh, was preferred. So I'm just wondering whether we actually have a look at that and see where we are with our Main Street master planning and for those unlisted properties, whether we could incentivise them 
to fall into something that they've all signed off on. We may just get a bit more buy-in. I think just to comment there, in bringing this back, we would certainly look at how this would fit with I guess, other actions that Council has in its strategic plan and other things that we are doing. So I think as, bringing, as part of bringing that back, we would look at how the lines might work that Council's proposed. So in summary, I think um, obviously the, there's a, well, I've been corrected, there's a shared objective to try and increase uptake in whatever way that, uh, that, that we can do that. That's, that's the objective if I could get a, is that, that's what I'm getting a sense of? Try another tap, see if we can get it. Okay, try another tap, see if we can get, get some more uptake. All right, lovely, thank you, Simon and Rick. Appreciate your time. Members, I now move on to item number 10, Councillor Varsky. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, look, my uh, um, purpose in raising this was just to ask a very brief question. So are you moving it then? Yes, I'll move it. Um, Can I have a second, please, Lord Mayor? Um, my concern is that there's uh, sufficient detail in respect of uh, item one, which is to provide funding of $58,000 to the hotel. It's clear what they're doing. They're structurally reinforcing the balcony and providing detail. But in respect of the Palmer Place proposal, there is no detail. It just says substantial conservation as part of adaptive reuse. Um, is it possible, given that this is $115,000, to see or hear some more detail of what's involved? I mean, is it being adapted as a new McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken or something? Or? No? Through the Chair, um, my understanding is it will be uh, consulting rooms. The scope of conservation work relates purely to the exterior of the building, so roof repairs and structural reinforcement to the timber work, um, <coughs> extensive work to address some of the chimneys, um, windows, doors, and quite a bit of repointing and salt down, again to the all four sides of the, the building itself. It's, so <coughs> the listing actually covers the whole house, so we're, it's not just the front or the side walls, that's the okay. That's fine, I'm happy. I understand. You're not happy. Yeah, Council, I just want to, when it's 50%, uh, I mean, 260,000 buys you a bit, but not, not a hell of a lot on a big house like that. Um, you're satisfied that you've seen a line by line. Um, so, not in this scenario, but how do, how do you safeguard against them just spending 115? Um, We've, do the chimneys, do the woodwork. Yeah, we've, we've seen a, a detailed breakdown from quantity surveyors. Uh, at this stage, it hasn't been tendered, but certainly we have quantity surveyors across it, detailed line by line. Um, and the way the Heritage Incentive Scheme works is that no money is provided to the building owner until the conservation work has been undertaken and the contractors have been paid and then we reimburse the allocated amount. Right, so you're in okay. So, so the work is done and we know it's done before any council money is... So it's the same as the small same. amounts, is it? Same principle, just larger. Right, okay. Members, any other questions? Uh, council, might we sum up? Summed up. Members, I'll put that. All those in favour? Clear that carried. Um, Mayor, uh, Council Martin, item number 11. Um, yes, I will be moving it, uh, Chair. The moving is printed. Thank you. And second, no, please. Council Deputy Lord Mayor Hender. Thank you, uh, Chair. Look, I, I, um, I just wanted to make a couple of observations. Um, and, and firstly, I'm uh, naturally pleased that we are going to have, as is noted, I think, um, in the table at page 57, um, a public meeting uh, and also a council meeting at which uh, people will be able to address elected members. So we have two public meetings. Um, and this pre-consultation has been sensational. It's a great idea that we have actually written to people affected or interested in this development 
we have erected signs on site and we have door knocked and that is really important and indeed I, I note from the information provided to us that as a consequence uh, of door knocking perhaps um, we've got uh, a better response in the pre-consultation to this DPA than for the colleges and institutions DPA which is just sensational and so I would urge more of the same that is signs on the site and uh, door knocking as a means of getting detailed feedback uh, from people and more importantly being able to answer their questions on the spot I think that's so important um, one minor matter, the uh, explanatory statement uh, at page 103 says uh, that the, uh, the draft of public consultation from July 22nd, um, uh, the DPA at least, will be available for inspection in Peary Street. May I ask that it's also made available at the uh, Community Centre in North Adelaide since there are residents who would go there to inspect that and not come into Peary Street. And Can we take it on notice? And, and I'd like also um, just to acknowledge uh, uh, the comments uh, made by residents in Buxton Street. They're worth amplifying. Uh, that is to say, uh, we need to make clear that the developer has the intention to preserve both the chapel, uh, the chapel at the back, and the primitive uh, Methodist church. Not that the building is primitive, but the Methodists were. Um, <laughs> Yes, but we don't make that clear in the documentation and so the question that people were asking in the consultation process was well why aren't you protecting the chapel and the primitive Methodist church? I know but we don't say that in the documents and so we need to say that in, in the documents. Um, uh, that is the, uh, uh, the developer's intention, that is our wish but it's not conveyed and if that could be contained more clearly in the document draft that's uh, available for distribution on the 22nd, that would be good. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, Councillor Wilkinson. I'd just like to state, state for the record that I've provided some advice to, to, the, um, uh, to the owner of the site that I don't have any contractual um, uh, um, so sorry, Councillor Wilkinson, I need to be very clear what you just said then. You're just saying you need to make decisions about it. Just want you to be clear what that's going to say. Because you're not going I think he's just saying he's had a conversation, not received any money. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. I just want him to be clear on what he's saying. I just, well, that's for the purpose of this meeting, I might just upset myself and get, get some advice, but I just wanted to be up front about that. So you're declaring a conflict of interest, sorry? No. Okay, you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and just, and you have to state the reason, Sandy, just because, because you've given. Because I've provided advice to the, to the owner of the land. Okay, fair enough. But you're also taking advice yourself. You're also taking advice about the conflict. And, 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 and um, thank you. Thank you. Just for now, I understand. So I'll just uh, request then that you leave and I'll just get someone to close the door. Okay. Um, okay. Um, do I have any other speakers on this? Can you check, give me a sec to check, please. I'll just go into a comment. I just wanted to ask a question through the chair. In relation to page 132, second paragraph, it talks about a combination of non complying triggers. Sorry, a combination of a non complying trigger of six levels and a maximum ceiling height of 18 metres. Um, and then it goes on to talk about um, the maximum height above which development would be non-complying is not necessarily or automatically attainable. Could you just clarify what's meant by that, please? 
132, second paragraph. On the one hand, it's saying that it's a non-complying trigger of six levels or 18 metres. And then it's saying that it's not necessarily or automatically attainable. So is the inference there that it could actually go higher if it's regarded as, what was the wording? Um, bear with me, sorry. It would, there would be an opportunity for higher density through context-sensitive design. Sure. Um, through, through the chair, um, what that comment does relate to is that well, there is a, there's a height guideline of six storeys. Buildings above six storeys would become non-compliant type developments, which would means, means third, party have, have third parties have appeal rights right. and the applicants don't have appeal rights. I guess a separate matter is in terms of each application is assessed on merit. So just whilst the development plan would state six storeys as that maximum, each application is assessed as to whether that height is suitable, which depends on a whole range of factors, which could be the location of the building on the site. That six storeys could be the massing, so the massing of the design. So, so the intent there is saying six is not necessarily if you like as a bright height. Each application would be assessed and who, on its merit. Through the chair, who who's likely to assess this development? What's the value of it likely to be? Again, it would depend on what. If it's looking at a full redevelopment of the site, yeah. um, then it's likely to be, it would suggest exceeding 10 million. I would suggest if it was, then it would be DAC, and it would be, would be council. Um, but again, that's, that's depending on the factors and when and what a proposal is for. Right. So the, the clarification I wanted was, we've set the non-compliant limit at six, and if any developer goes over that, they would then have to prove to the assessing body that it in fact fits in the context of, sorry, it, it fits or it's, it's <coughs> as merit based on this context sensitive design. But anyone living in that vicinity has the opportunity of third party appeal rights. I would suggest there's two separate matters. In yeah. Any any application, the applicant needs to demonstrate the merit. So that's that's based on an assessment of the policies that are proposed in, in the amendment. Um, then the trigger point, the, the six story becomes a trigger point of the process in which an application um, would go through. So that, that then affects the appeal rights and things. But but all applications would need to demonstrate merit against the and against an assessment of the policies that are proposed. Thank you. Uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Question through to administration. Um, is it, the recommendation in these papers suggests, doesn't suggest, says that uh, hot ratios are not Sorry, I'm Sorry, <laughs> right. Siri. Siri. Yeah. She's our th thirteenth th elected, elected member. Thirteenth elected member of the council. Siri, councillor Siri. Um, but the paper suggests that plot ratio um, is not a um, uh, necessary planning mechanism on this site. Can I ask? Is that because the retention of the row cottages, the restoration of the <coughs> corner, etc., etc., etc provide sufficient surety of planning to achieve a very reasonable outcome for that site? Um, yeah, through, through the chair, I guess, the, the approach has been taken is that the, the range of policies, the new policies and quite detailed, and quite, yeah, and quite detailed site-specific policies provide a sufficient framework to enable assessment of applications. So that includes just the heritage places, includes the concept plan, which indicates where development should occur, as well as quite detailed policy that's guiding where future built form should be located. Okay, thank you, Chair. So that gives me comfort. Thank you. 
Thank you. Do I have any other speakers? Uh, Councillor Martin, Jack, sum up. Summed up. Members, I'll put that. All those in favour? Declare that carried. Thank you. Um, can someone just grab the Councillor Wilkinson from wherever he may be? Thank you very much. Members, I now go to item number 12, part 25, Councillor Martin. I'm not moving this, Chair. Uh, may I have someone who, want, who will move this uh, item? Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by. Councillor Vishore. Deputy uh, Lord Mayor, yes, of course. Councillor Vishore. Councillor Martin. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, the reason I uh, pulled this item is that. I just want to uh, draw to the attention of councillors um, what a poor deal this is for the ratepayers of Adelaide. Um, putting to one side the, uh, the cheeky proposal from uh, the Cricket Association to pay no rent on the lease of the land um, uh, for the building because it's doing the ratepayers a favour by putting a building there that they won't be allowed to go into. Putting, putting that to one side and, and thankfully, by the way, this council will endorse APRA's recommendation that we reject that. Um, SACA is not a, a backyard cricket outfit. It is, according to their most recent uh, financial report, staging uh, professional sport. It has an annual turnover of $40 million. It has total assets of $78 million, from which it earns $7 million additional revenue. Um, it finished last year with a profit of $4.3 million, or so a turnover of $40 million. Now, um, we're going to give them that land at an 80% discount on the rent and charge them $4,500 a year for the land uh, for the building with an annual 4% increase for the next 42 years. 80% 80, 80 discount on the land and 4% rent review per year for the next four decades. Now, for the last 42 years, the annual uh, inflation rate, the annualised inflation rate, has been around 5.5%. That is 1.5% more than what we're respectively suggesting is appropriate here. $1,000 in 1973, 42 financial years ago, was worth almost $9,000 in 2015. So we're talking about a lot of money here. So uh, my question is, why wouldn't we just use CPI? Why, why are we proposing 4%? And moreover, later tonight, in a similar contract, we're proposing CPI. But we're going to give the SACA people 4%, which is a substantial discount. Then this council gave SACA $50,000 to draw up the pictures. Have a look at them on page 250. Enjoy them because you paid for them. The ratepayers of Adelaide, they're yours. Put them up on the wall, maybe, because they cost a lot. Uh, we did that. We gave them $50,000. Now, on top of that, according to the lease, uh, the ratepayers are going to foot the bill for a new access road to the new club rooms so the SACA club can drive comfortably in there to watch their cricket, have a drink, and that sort of stuff. Now, the administration says in the document here they don't know how much that's costing, but uh, they're going to have a look at it and come back and tell us. Um, but it's 85 metres long, and you're going to sign off on it tonight if you endorse this. And we're going to sign off on installing lighting at our cost on the roadway and into around the car park too, and paying the electricity on that for the next four decades. So, you know, if you approve this tonight, you're going to be paying for that too. And there's another pool for rate payers too. Um, SAC is going to pay for the car park, which is probably a good thing because they'll want to get the measurements right for the limos. You've got to get you know, the right size parking spot as you're taking your limo into the parking lot. But then, according to this agreement, we're going to pay to maintain the car park for the next 42 years. Maintain it. Now, that means, of course, in 42 years, it is likely it will need to be replaced along with the road as well. Car parks and roads don't last that long. So there are more costs. 
And, and I, I digress slightly and say I, I argued quite strenuously at the time of this uh, proposal that the car park should be underground because it was a waste of parklands to have a car park above ground and I was told that would put the kibosh on the deal. But if you have a look at the plans, you see that there are a suite of rooms underneath. So a, a car park could have gone there, but it, it hasn't gone there. And on top of that, we're buying into a dispute, which if you read the papers, uh, demonstrates that there's a sublease that uh, Sacker is giving to some old uh, boys football network, in fact, uh, uh, Ignatians. Ignatians. Old Ignatians. Same, old Ignatians, yeah. I, is that the Lord Mayor's School? I, I, I don't want to denigrate it just in case it is. Um, but anyway, it, it is a club that is in dispute already with SACA because they want 42 years and SACA will only give them 10. Um, and the real slap in the face, in my view, for ratepayers is, according to this lease, if there's a proposal, say, from the state government to redevelop this space, if they say in 2030 we want to put the Commonwealth Games there or something, they don't pay any compensation, but we do. We're responsible for paying compensation to SACA if the state government decides that it's going to devote the land to some other thing. Um, now, uh, finally, just one thing. Uh, on top of that, we don't get any access. Uh, we can't say we want to put a special event in there because it's not the lease. It, it's a, a pretty raw deal. And members, I did think about amending it, but it's... It's got so many shoddy elements to it that, frankly, I'm just going to vote against it. And I would encourage all of you to do the same. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a question through to administration before I speak to this matter. But the uh, item 1.3 in the recommendation uh, states that Council be required to give SACA 12 months notice and negotiate any public or special events proposed by the Council for the park. The rationale for 12 months, which seems like a long notice period, I must say. What was the net rationale of 12 months versus, let's say, six? Through the chair, the rationale for that was that SACA had to program the uh, the space. They actually programmed it on behalf of the uh, cricket association and the clubs that use it. So it's not a professional outfit on this particular site. It's there for community association cricket or district cricket. And the reason for that is they'll need to reprogram that. Perhaps I can also, without buying into the debate at all, but there is a leased area and a licensed area. The leased area is the building footprint only. The licensed area, which has not got exclusive use, is the car park area, the driveway in and, and so on, which ensures that whatever car park provision is there, it's there for the users of the parklands. Uh, unless there is an event on at the, at the time, and we're yet to enter into the discussions about a management model on the car park. However, it is a licensed area, not a leased area. Thank you, Chair. Now I'll speak to the matter. Um, look, that was my understanding too, so thank you for your clarification, Mr. Philippou. The I generally do support this because this matter has been many years in the making, uh, and I had concern with regards to only particularly one part of it, and that was, as Councillor Martin mentioned, was the debate about rent, because I was uncomfortable about the precedent that that may otherwise set for other facilities throughout our parklands. But notwithstanding, I do think that this is an extraordinarily good improvement to Park 25. Um, the, the west end of the city, obviously, is an area which is coming into focus more. It's opposite the new hospital. Um, I understand and accept that logic regarding 12 months notice, although I do say it's quite a long period of time, but as long as council can get access. Um, I do understand that make good provisions are important in this type of scenario because, of course, these are top shelf playing fields, so to speak, and uh, should we use them for events, which we may at some point in time, it's not unreasonable that council would need to make good after using them. I have another question though, uh, Mr. Philippou. I understand that the state government can, of course, use this site should they want, and they would have made good provisions, and that should council want to use the site at some point in time with 12 months notice, we would have made good provisions. Are those, provi are those make good provisions are, uh, uh, the same for both? Is my question. Through 
through the chair, the depending on how the um, a, a major event, as it's determined in this uh, document and as it's been described, is is determined. So we use the example of in the event that um, South Australia or the state government secures the Commonwealth Games, for instance, it's quite likely that legislation will be passed in order to have uh, open space available for those events to occur. Under that situation, council would not be in a position to control that process, and it would be a discussion with SACA to, to ensure that uh, there be clearly proclaimed notice for SACA to rethink what their use is uh, of the site. To answer your question, if the state government came in and chose to take over from SACA, it would be expected that the state would make have uh, responsibility to make good provisions under that arrangement. Thank you. And Chair, I uh, felt there was no need for me to declare any form of uh, conflict, uh, perceived, actual or otherwise. Uh, I'm not a member of the uh, Old Ignatians Football Club. I can hardly kick a football straight if I tried. Um, I am a former student of that school, but that was some 30 years ago, and I have had not a great deal of contact with the school since, so I don't think there's a reason for me to declare anything. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Moran? Yeah, look, I, I'm out I was fairly pleased with, with this. Um, I do take the point that um, why aren't they going to CPI? Uh, is it possible to um, separate the um, amount charged to, to the lease from this to be looked at again and pass everything else? Let me just get some advice <coughs> on that. So just, it's just which point you're just, can, I, can you scroll off? I mean, I'm happy with the length of the lease, oh, sorry, I'm happy yeah, with sorry. the St Eggies, I'm happy with the access road, I'm happy with the car parking. So let me just get some advice on uh, that minor. Through the chair, that's a commercial arrangement, so there's no reason why that number can't be changed or referenced in a different way, noting that it can be um, uh, can be seen as less as it's forecast by or well, through the 42 years. So yes is the answer, but let me just get some procedural advice now. Um, Councillor Moran, can I suggest you move an amendment and add that as a point? Because I, I 1.1 is only the app, noting Apples. Um, is it possible to take the lease out altogether, or is that really the wound right through? No, I think, I think you're just about the quantitative numbers, right? Can I just ask you why is it this confidential? No, but why isn't it? Because, I guess because it's public. Less confidential than I don't think any of our leases in, are now, are they? Am I correct with the parklands? Sorry, Mike. Through, oh, through the chair, this, the, the, the paper before you and the recommendation seeks council's support to go to public consultation on parklands lease, oh, okay. of which the term is 42 years. So there's a public consultation um, okay, so recommendation here. And as a result, so the, the lease parklands lease has to, go in, has to be seen in public or heard in public. Okay, so the lease comes back to this council, the council? Yes, through the chair, following public consultation, it comes back to council for endorsement before it then goes before both houses of parliament for ratification. So councilman, does that give you the, um, uh, are you okay with that, that the lease is coming back to this council no. for approval? For How likely? It has, has go, it has to go to public consultation yeah, first. Yeah, I know it's very hard to add to, add to the, um, the financial, the dollar amount mm. after that. I'd rather, I'd rather um, yeah. defer that section of it to re-look re at um, why, why it's I, occurring. I don't think we can. On this, you'd have to defer the whole item, I think. Let me just get some, Mike, can you clarify that? Just for clarity, can I just have the question again? Sorry. So, Mike, um, yeah, relating to the um, some of the commercial terms of the lease, that um, Catherine has some questions over. Obviously, when you go to consultation, it's very difficult to change it after the fact. So she's wondering, how do we, um, how do we sort of, uh, how does it make known uh, that we have some questions over those commercial terms before it goes to consultation? Am I correct? Is that? I guess through the chair, it's potentially a question for um, the committee secretariat in terms of 
uh, procedural matters, but, it, but the way this is worded is that APLA have given advice and that the advice before you in that recommendation is for noting. So I, I'll probably have to defer to ComSec on how that might um, might change. Um, but there is, uh, it is, uh, a, a con a, at least it's going out to consultation. So I would have thought you've got every flexibility to determine what how you want that lease to read before it goes out. Councillor Moran, you, um, there might be a suggestion that you do make a minor amendment. Um, stand by. Uh, what about we defer this to the next council meeting um, for advice from the administration about CPI increases, the true, dollar, true commercial value, the true commercial value, why why it has attracted the 80% discount? Um, I know we have a book of rules now on, on leasing. I just need that explain why this one. So I'm happy to defer. Yeah, we do have a policy, so um, yeah. I'll take some advice the on that. not here, so. Through the chair, the fees and charges are in line with the policy, fees and which was endorsed in January. Well, I gathered that, but um, what what does it what hurdles does it have to get over to get to attract such a large eighty percent discount when this is a private sports club? Well, it's in relation to uh, SACA undertaking all the maintenance, mm -hmm. so it's in line with the university and all the other leases in the parklands. They're not undergoing. Can you use your mic, Councillor? But I, I thought we were maintaining access roads and car parks and. Uh, through the chair, that's not in the least area. So no. they're, they're maintaining the building and the parking fields. Okay. So I've got a suggestion um, from um, uh, my advisors here that if you you could send it. Uh, through as is, that would be an option, and then in the meantime, the administration will clarify some of that. Um, they will take it on notice to clarify some of that. Well, I, will change, I will change one thing. I'll move as is, but I'll change four percent to CPI. No, don't. No, no. no. If I can, actually I can do. Do. Yeah. 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 Okay, so Catherine, okay, yeah. you've got the floor. Are you, are you going to move an amendment or not? Because that's up no, to you. I won't then. Okay. All right, then, thank you. Now I'm going to Deputy Lord Mayor, then I'm going to Councillor Bishore. So if I can just um, talk quickly to that. The, um, I've, I've recently been involved in some commercial leasings and I've, I've had people put two different propositions to me. So I think both are considered to be some commercial operations. That is, one one of the um, people I was dealing with put CPI, one put 4%. So I think they're both considered to be legitimate um, uh, rates to increase. At the moment, depending on whether you're looking at the national CPI or the state CPI, it's 1.3, I think, if you look at the Australian CPI as at uh, the December quarter, no, the March quarter. If you look at the state CPI, I think it's 0 0.07, uh, 0 0.7, I mean, CPI. So at the, at the moment, 4% is substantially in advance of the CPI. Yes, of course, we, we don't know what the, how that will play out over time, but you're always having a punt on that, really. So I think. I, I don't mind the, the, the CPI. I do have a question though about the, uh, sorry, the 4%. I, mean, I think it's neither here nor there. You've just got to could we choose one of those things and decide it. Um, and I'm, happy, I'm content with 4%. Currently, it's going to be to our advantage. The question I have though is about is about the 80% discount and just to get a better understanding of it. It's applied because, uh, so are we applying our new leasing policy or are we playing our old one on the basis that this is a rolling over of a sort of a, a current arrangement? Uh, so through the chair, I'll just clarify the 4% is actually in the policy, yep. so which was endorsed in January, okay. and the 80% is if the uh, lessee undertakes all the maintenance on the building. Okay. So as per the, the existing policy. policy. So it's so not to do with their status as a, as a, a, no. a, a community group or anything like that? No, either. it's to do with if the organisation undertakes all the maintenance on the building, that's when the discount applies. Okay. So if council was to undertake the maintenance, it would be a different uh, percentage. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I, I just want to make a couple of points about um, the, in the lighting and the access roads. I mean, I think it is our responsibility. The parklands are our parklands, and if we're lighting them, then it does make sense that we pay, we pay for lighting and that we pay for access roads. That's just sort of standard practice within the parklands. Um, but I, I, um, I, I mean, I'm also 
a little bit uncomfortable about the brand, I have to say, but if, it's, if we're applying our own policy, there's not much we can do about that. So I, my view is we should get this out to consultation um, and then uh, we, can, we can have a look at it when it comes back from consultation. Councillor Vishaw. Um, thank you, and with my apologies, Councillor Moran, for calling out across the table. But um, I know that CPR at the moment is 0.7, so we sort of it's going to take a while, unless you do a 4% or CPR, whichever is the greater. Um, I don't know whether the 4% that's currently in the policy ex extends to 42 leases or whether it's an annual, an annual increase. Um, uh, through the chair, it's, it's an annual increase. Annual increase. That applies to all leases. So um, it's just when you lock it in for 42 years, um, who knows. Um, my, my question was also really uh, around uh, point three, which was um, the feasibility into the off-street parking and the roadway and the um, lighting, etc. Is that required before they can actually do the construction, like in terms of that roadway um, and the parking, things like that? Through the chair, the original report that went to CAP to APLA, yeah. which was at the request of SACA, was to offset or provide a quid pro quo for the delivery of public car parking on the licensed area, which was which was originally at their uh, proposed to be at their cost, yeah. which reflected the same value as the uh, rent over 42 years with a compounding effect of the 4% increase. So the way it was pitched there was that it was a quid pro quo. So it wasn't a rent uh, discount or rent free because of the capital investment on the building. Yes. It was a quid pro quo for the car park in the licensed that. area. That was um, um, rejected by APLA. And so in order to um, put forward an alternate solution here, the view was for the administration to go away and undertake a feasibility of the cost of a car park which is sympathetic to the parklands environment to provide parking for parklands users and potentially become a come outside of the capital cost of the of SACA. That's just another alternative. It's at council's discretion as to how it chooses to, to deal with that. Thank you. Uh, Council Wilkinson. Um, the 1.1 million including 4% rent reviews over a 42 year period is $26,000 if it was developed per year. Um, is that the amount after the 80% discount or before the 80% discount? Through the chair, if I could just help you with the um, with the maths on that. If you turn to page 206, so uh, paragraph 30, uh, sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, uh, paragraph 36 and the table that's in there, top of page 209. It gives you a total uh, rental per annum of $10,250. So that's applied across the three, the three levels being ground floor, first floor and second floor. And it's that value that's compounding at 4% over 42 years to arrive at a value of 1.074 million um, in total. So ten grand a year only. That's right, which is in line with the policy. So that includes the eighty percent discount because SACA are undertaking maintenance on the building, and they're also maintaining the premium, the surface, the playing surface to a premium grade or premium playing uh, area. Those costs are identified in paragraph forty at four hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Uh, total costs there, and includes uh, staff and resources as well. Is that? Uh, yes, per, per year. year. Yeah. And what what um, provision is there for rent rent review? And I note that there's a discrepancy between the sublease to Saint Ignatius five plus five years, and then a forty two head lease. So. What, what's to stop them basically reviewing their rent and upping the value of the sublease to cover, fully cover their rent to the sublease? Um, then just charging St. Ignatius $10,000, which completely covers the head lease because it's so generous. So, how do we cover that? 
I'm uncomfortable. Through the chair, the any sublease um, negotiation happens through council. So council signs off on the sublease arrangements, and it has to be aligned with the uh, policy of the day in terms of uh, in terms of rent value. So there isn't provision in the policy to uh, give the Headley C, being SACA in this case, the opportunity to charge more than what they would be charged um, in any way. The current policy um, that you signed off on in January only allows for subleases to extend to five years. Um, that, that posed a challenge for St Ignatians who have uh, hit a historical use of this area for um, many, many years. And as a result, the question has been raised uh, with council as to, with the administration through this discussion, and then put to you as to whether a five plus five would be available um, for uh, the, uh, the football club to, uh, to take out that sublease. So just to clarify that, we, we imposed the maximum five years. Through the, through the chair, the a sublease uh, arrangement was identified in the policy that, would, that cannot extend beyond five years. Um, I'm just thank you for those questions. I I um I understand they're spending close on eight million dollars on the capital in, in investment, but I um I I feel uncomfortable with just how small an amount ten thousand dollars a year for, for that um uh, basically the, the almost a forty two year lease is actually like buying the land you know there for for, for that amount just seems manifestly that to me. I understand it's in line with our council policy, but I'm not comfortable with the old council policy. No, it's a new council policy. The one we have endorsed about through the old one. Which I which I policy because I understood that because we started the negotiations with the old policy that you were were through the chair that's correct that it's it's at fifty dollars not fifty five. So the new policy is fifty five dollars per square meter. The old our plan strategy was 50. Is that, is that policy or, but, or you're talking about the budget, the um, uh, fees and charges? Because there's a, there's a difference. No, I'm talking about the, initially it was the Parklands property strategy yep. and now it's the Parklands leasing and licensing policy. So what, what, so which one does it come under? The current policy. Oh, so the second one? The second one. Which is the new the one? The updated new one. Yeah. Can you just be very keen to say the updated one or the? No, so because because we started, as I said, because we started negotiations a few years ago, this particular lease was excluded from the new policy. So it's, it's we're not charging them fifty five; it's at fifty. So what would be the what would the rent be in the new policy? Sorry, fifty. Extra five dollars. Fifty-five. Okay, okay, Councillor Moran, sorry, you, you have spoken. I've got Councillor Starmer, then I've got well, Councillor well, Clarion. Point of order. Well, um, Councillor, sorry, point of order. What we've is had, your point we've of had order? two answers that contradict each other. Yeah. Um, I, I specifically asked, was this negotiated under the old policy or the new policy? And I got, I was told it was, it's negotiated under the new policy. And now being told that it's the old policy rate. Uh, can we have some absolute clarity about that, please? Because we uh, we don't have clarity in the chamber at the moment. Through the okay. chair, I can perhaps help. Thanks. That's okay. The the it was negotiated. Um, the negotiation started when the Parklands property strategy was in effect, uh, and as a result, the 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 change in policy in 2016 required an expression of interest process to play out on all expired uh, leases except this was already under negotiation. So this is why it's excluded from the new policy. The numbers, the, the square metre rate for clarity, because I think the question got confused and that's why the answer got confused. The $50 a square metre that's referenced in table uh, table two on page 209, it comes from the Parklands property strategy because that was the old document that was this negotiation started under. The difference between this value of $50 a square metre under the Parklands property strategy and the new policy was at $55 a square metre. So there's a 10% difference in square metre rate, but the old rate has been applied because that's when the negotiation started. But every other bit of the policy, like the discount for commercial for maintenance and all that, is under the new policy? Um, the terms of those are exactly the same, so it doesn't matter. Councillor Slammer. 
Yeah. But just just on from that then, is is there in that policy, the, the, the new policy, a provision for market review over and above the the CPI, the plus four percent rent review? So we can look at maybe in five years time, look at is it still is a fifty by then whatever it is dollars a square meter still market value or not? Generally, market review would or, or, or revaluation would occur when uh, there's a, a timing or a milestone in a, in a lease. In this case, the milestone is 21 years, and then there's a right of uh, renewal for another 21. So that's where the 42 years comes from. If council wants to pursue um, milestones within the first 21, it's at liberty to do so, noting that that has not been part of the negotiation with SACA today. Councillor Clarahan. I'm just wondering whether I should declare that I've not accepted free membership from SACA before I speak. Um, um, uh, my questions forward. pertain to one was the issue of subleasing and have we what have we got in our policy that prevents um, a cashed up club subleasing to a number of clubs, be it a bridge club or a sporting club, that, as I think someone raised it before, that exceeds the actual cost that the club is paying. So we'll just, we'll just have the answer, but we'll have it, have it again. Well, we were talking about one. There's a clause in the lease. Through the chair, it's the, the discipline and principle through the policy says that a sublease cannot be entered into without council's consent. That's probably the answer to the question. However, for a bridge club or a club to have, to have a casual hire for a night, that would have to follow council's uh, fees and charges uh, arrangements at any particular time, but that's not a lease, that's just a hiring uh, of the space for a period of time. So are you saying through the chair that we actually determine their hiring? What their hiring uh, costs will be? They have to be informed by council's fees and charges policy at the time that's signed off by council at every business plan and budget. Okay. And I'm not still not convinced that, you know, I mean, if it has to be, get the permission of council and probably through delegation, if there were five clubs using the premises on a sublet basis, at what stage would we say, well, obviously the return on these subleases are greater than the sum the club itself is paying um, to occupy this. Through the chair, that's a scenario we probably haven't modelled, um, but it's highly unlikely we'll have multiple subleases that aren't in conflict with each other and aren't, with, and aren't uh, against the permitted use that's built into the lease as well. So it's highly unlikely there'll be five subleases trying to do the same thing at the same time and driving a rent uh, return back to SACA as Headley C, which is greater than what we would receive from SACA. Okay. My other question was around, um, I guess I liken this particular development to the University of Adelaide um, development in Lower North Adelaide. Um, and admittedly, there aren't residents living around there. Um, and I imagine the hospital's built in such a way that any after hours activity wouldn't impact on the amenity of the hospital. But have we made any attempts to prevent this from being a, another entertainment precinct in the parklands in terms of its wedding uh, uh, members hiring it for their wedding or their 21st or their 50th or whatever? Um, what what is there to actually prevent it becoming a pavilion in the park or a sort of a reception area? Through the chair, we just have a min. I need to find the permit, permitted use schedule in the in the lease because it will help answer that question. Okay. Through the chair, it would be the same conditions as the university, so all the events would have to be related to sport, and that would obviously stop any. Um, sort of you know, private functions, so it's it's in line with 
um, the permitted use at the university, which has been changed to only uh, sporting. Uh, Thank you. So, Mike, have you got that uh, lease term? Or? Through the chair, if you have a look at page 244, which is titled, it's a table and it's titled First Schedule. Uh, item 6, uh, titled Permitted Use, gives you the description under which the use of the space can be uh, applied. And that is consistent with um, with other major leases in the area for sporting and recreational use. Thank you, um, Councillor Cobell. Yeah, just um, uh, yeah, just in relation to point three about the roadway, um, like that's not something that was put before APLA. That wasn't discussed at APLA. Um, but I can I can understand the need for it um, given the sizing of the car park and the changes that are going to be made there with um, with with the tennis courts going. Um, when it comes to the cost that's likely to be associated with that and the ongoing maintenance of it, the putting in the lighting, do we have any idea at this stage of how much that might cost council? Through the chair, at this stage we, we don't, uh, noting that there is no opportunity for on-street parking to access that part of the parklands. Um, so we will need to look at how the uh, new car parking services, both the, the needs of SACA and its, uh, and its affiliates and the association uh, opportunities and the footy club, as well as general use across the parkland. So uh, ultimately, if there's going to be a, a car park there, which there already is, by the way, we need to make sure the access to it is safe. So we'll bring that, that cost back to you once we've done the work. Okay, yeah, just on that, like um, with the access, we're looking at building then a public road, which we maintain with lighting for a private or a public car park or a combination thereof. Through the chair, it's on the parkland, so it's a public car park in a licensed area, so it has not got uh, unlimited exclusive use. It is there for parklands users. Yeah. And, okay, thank you. Hello, Mayor, you've got a question? I have. It's just one quick question, Chair. Thank you. It's a point of clarification. Um, the This proposal um, involves a relatively substantial reduction in the footprint of the built form on the parklands. Um, yes. <coughs> could you clarify that number with me, please? Through the Chair, if I could perhaps direct you to uh, paragraph 12. Uh, the building footprint, as in the actual, not the number of the total square meterage or floor, the letter of wear area, but the building footprint itself um, is reduced by 60% to the current built form that's, uh, that's in that area, and the car parking area is reduced by 13%. Thanks, Mr. Fillmore. Councillor Kerr, I have one question. Yeah. Um, I read somewhere in the report um, that there would be three full time staff and three part time staff. Does this mean that these club rooms will also become offices? Through the chair, I do believe that the, the groundsman's office which I think there already exists an office in the current old building. So my, I read somewhere that it was going to be three people with three part-timers employed there at that particular venue. Through the chair, I think that's correct. So where are they going to be housed in that? Are they going to be there as full-time um, employees? And therefore, that's correct, they will be. Do we have other examples of where that happens in the parklands? That Apart from Adelaide Oval and a tennis centre? Through the chair, that would probably happen at the Adelaide Uni as well. You're saying there's an office there? That's correct. For full-time occupancy? For two, two or three groundsmen. Okay. And that complies with our policies? Uh, through the chair, it does. And we, so we don't specify whether it's for groundsmen or whether it actually becomes an administrative office. All right, you've received the answer. No, no, I want a clarification because this has a flow on effect to others yeah. as well as is, to whether we're no, accommodating it specify. offices in our parkland the, buildings. The answer is it doesn't specify. All grounds people and facilities for them. Oh, through the chair, it's only for grounds, the yes. uh, grounds yes. keepers. So. 
Well, Mayor, one more quick question, and then we're going back to the uh, lever. Thank you, Chair, and I apologise for the litany of questions, but this is an important matter. Um, Chair, I was very pleased to see uh, administration. Christian, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, the, I just would like some absolute clarity in terms of what SACA is proposing to spend here. Um, it's, it says there's a number here of seven point, almost $8 million. Does that include the full extent of this project, including, of course, the um, improvements to the grounds on the four ovals, or is that simply the built form? Through the chair, I'll just get Ray to answer that question. Through the chair. So in essence, I think it's no. Um, I think there is more expenditure to do with the ovals, but they didn't originally know what that was in the original cost estimates. So, Ray, what, what is that? Do you have any information which would be able to advise us as to what that potentially could be at the outside? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, that, that will come back to us after consultation on this piece, I presume, is that? Yeah, I think they should have more detail at that time. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I did Lord Mayor Hendo, would you like to sum up, please? Um, look, members, I moved this really to get the discussion going, um, but, um, and so I share some of the concerns, but if I can just say, um, the, the outcome here is a great outcome for our parklands in the sense that what we're getting is, I don't know if you've spent any time down in that area, but I have, and it's very, very tatty as things currently stand. There's some, there's some tatty buildings, there's some poor um, uh, tennis courts, and, and it's, it's a dilapidated part of our parklands. What we've got here is the opportunity to have a smaller building, a very substantially smaller building that's of an elegant design, to have a, a, a much improved car park with permeability and all sorts of things. So that, um, uh, we've, uh, we're getting a, um, a, a, um, an area that's going to be much nicer for our public to use. And bear in mind, this is going to be opposite a hospital, which is going to have, I don't know, between five and 7,000 people in it every day who are going to want to have a space where they can go and spend time. And this will be open. The, the playing fields associated with this development are going to be open to the public at all times. So we are very uh, substantially enhancing a bit of the parklands that does need enhancement. The, the proposal has been scrutinised by APLA. It's, within, it's in accordance with our policy. Um, so I urge members to, to, um, to, to vote for it for now, but I do just want to point out a couple of things. That is, there are two more opportunities for scrutiny. There's an opportunity at council next week if people have got some time to give some further consideration to some of the issues that have been raised today. And then, of course, all we're doing is putting it out for consultation. There'll be an opportunity when it comes back to us. Um, so I think, for, for mine, the appropriate thing to do now is to, is to get it through so that we can get it out to consultation. But can I ask the administration whether they could recirculate the policy, the almost up-to-date up -to policy to all the members so that we can actually have a look at it? Because I don't think the concern is that you haven't applied the policy. I think there is some concern about whether the policy, is, uh, this policy setting is, is right. And uh, I, I think a number of members might be interested in having a read of that between now and next week. That can be taken on notice. Uh, thank you, members. I'll put that all those in favour. All those against? Declare that carried. Thank you. Councillor Clarehan, item number 14. These are out of session papers to note. Are you moving as printed? Um, happy to move as printed. I and do have a second question. Mm. Lord Mayor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but look, it was just in, and I don't seem to have my notes here, so I have to try and recall what it was, but it had something to do with um, changes to the, or no changes to the uh, planning development and infrastructure building as it relates to um, historical conservation zones and something about 51% of the owners have to agree to a an historical conservation zone before it can be declared thus. And I was just thinking, well, given the number of people absent, number of absent landlords in North Adelaide, like about 70% or more, uh, we wouldn't have a hope in hell of getting a historical conservation zone established there now. And what hope have we got for other areas of the city? Yep, through the presiding member, um, probably direct page 264, paragraph 14. Uh -huh. um, 
does identify correct that the the outcome of the bill was that it does need to be 50 was 51 percent of people or affected owners to agree to that designation um, that was something that council did comment on against that intent in, in our comments on on the bill but that was passed so that's how it stands at the moment that's how the bill stands as, and do, as as through, passed, yes. sorry through the chair do we have any current uh will we have uh, a requirement or a desire to declare future historic conservation zones for our residential or other areas in the city in the future? Um, I guess what we do have now is a conservation zone in North Adelaide and a conservation zone in the southeast of the city. I guess that's a matter for council down the track if there were to be further, further I guess areas looked at in terms of that, but I really couldn't answer that now. Okay, I just thought that members might be need to be aware of that, uh, given there are lots of area, historical areas in the city, uh, but handing it over to 51% uh, of the owners beggars belief, mm -hmm. especially given the majority of them may not even you know live live in the area, and they're absentee landlords, as is the case with the CBD in North Adelaide may not be the situation in residential areas of the, of the metropolitan area, but it's certainly the case in the CBD and North Adelaide. We would just remember we're talking about the papers tonight, yes. our session papers tonight. Um, I um, had some issue with our session papers because they really don't enable proper discussion of the subject of the quite important like like this one. And um, the thing about the historic conservation zones <coughs> is certainly in residential areas that the generally understood fact amongst valuers is that historic conservation zones and holistic broad based heritage protection actually increases property values in residential areas. St Peter's College Park, for example, has got the highest average property value in the residential area, and that's all historic conservation zone. Um, the, that said, that, that provides protection from demolition. The North Adelaide Historic Conservation Zone doesn't actually provide any protection against demolition of unlisted buildings, so it affords no more demolition protection than uh, um, than just the listing of the buildings. So there have been many blue stone houses in North Adelaide demolished, which were not listed, even though they fell within the historic conservation zone. So um, I'm not so uncomfortable with the 51% in that, provided it includes all all property, including existing owners who've got existing ones that they're happy with the listings of, um, not not just the new new unlisted properties and stuff like that. So. Um, um, but that is the fact that residential, historic areas in residential are increased in value by having holistic protection. And that fact ought to be broadcast. Members, uh, can I put that, uh, if you're summed up, Councillor Carahan, uh, to our session papers to note. All those in favour, say that carried. Members, we've come to other business. Do I have any? I've got two questions uh, without notice coming from the Lord Mayor. He's just left the room for a minute. Uh, do I have any others? Okay, Lord Mayor, uh, I believe you've got two questions without notice. I do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the uh, bathroom break. Members, um, I have a question through to administration uh, uh, chair or CEO. Um, one is with regards to the Commonwealth Games, and I have uh, I purchased a copy of Mr. David Cook's uh, book. Are you going to read out the question? Of course, Chair. Further to the Premier's announcement on the 2nd of July 2016 that the State Government intends to investigate the feas feasibility of bid bidding and holding potentially a Commonwealth Games in Adelaide in 2030, my question is, Chair, A, has Council Administration investigated this opportunity at any time in recent years? B, how does Council Administration intend to engage with the State Government to assist with their feasibility analysis? 
and C, can a regular uh, reporting mechanism be established to inform elected members? That's my first question, Chair. So, uh, Claire Mockler is going to respond to that. Uh, through the Chair, administration has not formally investigated um, any opportunity um, on behalf of Council or in collaboration with State Government um, to host the Commonwealth Games in 2013. That's the first part. Uh, the second part, uh, the Department of Premier and Cabinet today has advised us that the Premier at the moment is still directly managing uh, this project. Um, they will uh, reach out to Council if they want our support, but in the meantime, we have um, advised Premier Cabinet that if they uh, wish um, to have Council support, then they could uh, put that in writing to us and we can bring that formally back to Council uh, to see what that support could look like and the level of involvement that would be required from us. Um, and in terms of semi-regular reporting, there's various mechanisms we can do that and we're happy to keep Council up to date either through e-news or through out of session papers or through formal reporting back uh, through committee. Thank you, Director Claire Mockler. My second question, Chair. Yes, Lord Mayor, did, did you want, um, if you want your question, by the way, to go into the minutes, that has to be moved and seconded, just advising you. By myself, Chair. Yeah, you can move. <laughs> Happy to move my first question. If someone cares. Second, second question is regarding the solid waste levy. Further to the Treasurer's announcement on the 4th of July 2016 that the State Government intends to increase the solid waste levy for Metro Councils from $62 to $76 a tonne on the 1st of September 2016 before rising progressively to $103 per tonne by 2920. First question is, A, what is the estimated financial impact that this will have on the Adelaide City Council's recently endorsed 2016-2017 budget? Question B, is the City of Adelaide eligible to partially or wholly offset this potential cost increase via the State Government's Waste to Resources Fund? C, what is the potential impact of the above and Council's carbon neutral Adelaide 2025 objective? So welcome, Tom McCready. Is that, are you answering the question, Tom? Mike? Mm -hmm. well, who's up? Alex. Beth? Beth? Yes. Sorry. Uh, so, I just well start with question one, the financial impact. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Chair. And um, we may want to pass to Ms Nurtrix at some of the detail in terms of the um, economic impacts. The, um, the estimated cost for year one, given it'll be a 10 month year, so it commences September one, is around about $88,000. That'll increase in future years, not taking into account growth, somewhere between $350,000 and $500,000 over the four year period. But we'll have to do some more work in analysing projected growth, as well as the way we manage our services and our um, consumer behaviours. Uh, any uh, response to the um, partial, partially or wholly offset the potential through the Waste to Resources Fund? Certainly. Uh, through the Chair, uh, Lord Mayor, uh, the, um, in terms of an offset, uh, the Waste to Resources Fund does not allow Council to make applications to partially or wholly offset operational costs. Um, and we're also, as yet, unaware as to whether the funding criteria and management arrangements for the Wasted Resources Fund will be changed. Um, however, given Council's uh, partnership with the Government uh, for Adelaide to be the world's first carbon neutral city um, and the announcement of a $21.9 million funding package that will be drawn from the fund for and I quote, climate change initiatives to transition the state's economy to a low, low carbon future and make Adelaide a carbon neutral city. Um, I think it's reasonable to say that we will be certainly speaking with them about the opportunity to seek funding uh, for a range of projects uh, in the future. That's the that's part B of the question. There's a bit of a no and a maybe in that. And uh, uh, Lord Mayor, have you are you satisfied that your all three parts have been answered? I no, think, Mr. Natras, is there any further information regarding Part C of that question? Then, have you just answered Part B and C? Um, in relation to Part C, 
Um, the important uh, point is that we are in the process of negotiating discussion, discussing the carbon to Adelaide action plan. So it is a live discussion. Uh, this certainly means that uh, we have greater clarity of, of what's available. Um, in terms of it as a price signal to people who are disposing waste, it's been proven as an effective <coughs> mechanism for waste, uh, reducing waste to landfill and increasing recycling rates. So our expectation is it will have a positive effect on reducing carbon emissions from the city over time. Well, Bill, would you like that question to be included in the minutes? I would, Chair. So I'll, I'll second I'll move Councillor it. Corbell. All those in favour? And that carried. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Chair. Members, do I have any other business? I'll then close the meeting. Thank you. Yeah, have a quick break. Thank
Members, I re-adjourn Infrastructure and Public Space Committee. Can have members seated, please. We have a quorum in the room, so I will commence. The Infrastructure and Public Space Committee acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to Elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural values, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. Item 2, apologies and leave of absence. On leave, Councillor Antic, there are apologies from Councillor Abia. Confirmation of the minutes, 7th of June. Do I have a mover for the minutes? <coughs> mover, Councillor Slammer, seconded by the Lord Mayor. Uh, any discussion, division from that? I put that. All those in favour? All those opposed? Carried. Thank you. Public item four, public forum. We have no items from public forum. Item 5, Chair's Verbal Report. Um, I just, um, thanks to Councillor Slama, have um, the um, pleasure in, um, uh, as, as Chair of the Infrastructure and Public Space Committee, in acknowledging the $50 million tram extension that, 
the Outlaw of Terrace has just been announced by the state government, which um, has an infrastructure project that benefits the uh, the city of Adelaide. That's just fantastic. So um, thank you to the state government for that. Now, items for adoption on the block. Um, item seven is um, uh, a presentation. So we'll come back to that. Item eight. Renewal of Glover, Glover Playground. Yeah. Councillor Martin. <laughs> Item 9, Brown Hill Creek Stormwater Management Project. No one. Item 10, Reconciliation Plaza Ongoing Management. Councillor Martin. Item 11, Closure and transfer of a portion of Gunson Street. Okay, so I put the two items that uh, weren't called, items 9 and 11, to have a mover. Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Slama. I put that. All those in favour? All those opposed? Those two items are carried. That brings us back to Councillor Martin for item 8, renewal of Glover. Oh, sorry, my apologies. That brings us back to item 7, where we have a presentation from Jeff Fisher of the Australian Water Environment and Tom Whitney from, from the Adelaide City Council Administration. Thank you, Jeff and Tom. Everybody, it's through the speaker. Uh, good evening, all. I have uh, yeah, Jeff Fisher, the Director of Australian Water Environments, uh, alongside. This reports on the Tangmandilla Native Revegetation and Bank Stabilisation Project. Uh, it's the sixth stage and final stage of a previously endorsed 2008 Council con uh, endorsed concept plan to natively revegetate the Tangmandilla Park 11. Uh, as we came to deliver this final stage, uh, it was deemed by administration that it was unfeasible to do the native revegetation due to the riverbank erosion and the bank stabilisation risks. Uh, these risks were temporarily managed by and the ongoing management by administration while detailed design was developed by uh, Jeff and AWE. That uh, detailed design has now been complete and in terms uh, of this bank stabilisation and native revegetation, there is the need to remove 37 trees. So Jeff will now run through a quick presentation on why the 37 trees will need to be removed for the uh, bank to be stabilised and native revegetation implemented. So over Jeff. Thank you, thank you, Tom. Um, what I was planning to do tonight is just uh, go through the uh, the issues, if you like, that we're trying to deal with, and also the design principles, so the council can be uh, well informed of the, the background, if you like, and the logic behind the, uh, the removal of, of the trees and and the works that were being proposed. Sorry. Thank you. So just to uh, refresh our memories, the area we're talking about is um, <coughs> um, is just north of the, the zoo on the northern bank behind the zoo with Prime Road down there on the bottom. Uh, <coughs> so the area is obviously an area of uh, high uh, public use um, with the major road in terms of Warren Rural Drive and the bank that we're particularly concerned about uh, is a section of land, if you like, that lies between the linear park um, so that the, um, the walking trail, the shared path, is part of the linear park and, and the Katorans through here. Um, and that area between the, the path and the, and the river is the area that's uh, subject to quite severe erosion. Um, this is what it looks like if you stand on uh, or near the uh, Farm Road Bridge and look upstream. You can see it's uh, this quite dense um, vegetation, exotic vegetation, <coughs> mixture of mainly palm trees and, and ash trees. Um, and you can also see, if you look further down the shop there, um, some areas of, of bank erosion. So the issues, um, severe bank erosion, as Tom has said in his, um, in his report, uh, introduction, 
And those severe bank issues are creating a number of like sub issues or the cause of a number of issues such as uh, public safety. Uh, there are trees falling into the River Torrens, which is obviously not ideal. Um, we're also getting a large amount of sediment through the bank collapses falling into the, into the Torrens and the lake, um, and obviously a, a loss, lock, uh, sorry, a loss of amenity. Okay, so the public safety issues. So you can see we've got quite close proximity to the shared path there and, and the bank, the vertical banks that are collapsing. Um, that's on the right there. If you look to the left, you can see uh, there's a bit of orange bunting along there, which council administration has put up to provide a visual warning, if you like. It's, it is um, attached to one of the guardrails there or fences. Um, but certainly there is quite serious concern about the, um, the safety of the public in this area. Falling trees, so the vegetation might look a little bit dense, but it's um, of various uh, <laughs> condition and um, there are a number of trees which are falling in, which is obviously not ideal. In fact, it's quite serious. Uh, one of the issues with the falling trees is not only that, I guess, the trees ending up in, in the waterway, um, but also that it basically takes a lot of bank with it. So you're creating a lot of um, increased disturbance, if you, if you like, to the bank um, and, and exacerbating <laughs> the falling issues. A number of the trees are in poor condition because they're, they're trying to subsist, if you like, on a collapsing bank. Uh, this is a little bit further along. Um, so you can see again quite dramatically that there's um, a very vertical bank there that's collapsing. Uh, if you look closely there into the, sort of the middle of the, the, um, the shot, there's a little white dot, and that's actually a tree which uh, council removed uh, earlier, in fact, late last year, I think it was before Christmas, that was um, creating great um, tension cracks in the bank and the tree was um, about to fall into the riverside. Council needed to get a crane in to, uh, to remove the tree. Okay, so this area, um, in, back I think in 2008, Council um, endorsed a, um, a concept plan that involved revegetation of this area with native plants and to provide biodiversity. And really the aim, if you like, or the objective of the site is to revitalise the site and provide destination for recreation, conservation, education, and habitat while addressing significant erosion and biodiversity issues. So that's the overarching objective, if you like, in our design process that we're trying to support the Perthville Council. So some of the design principles we've applied, um, we obviously need, to, the core of it is to improve bank stability. We need to provide an, or ensure we have a long-term solution. We don't want to be coming back in five, 10, or even 20 years um, doing major works in this area. We've got to try and minimise costs, obviously. Um, it's a tricky site. Um, trees are falling in, banks are collapsing, but we want to try and minimise the unnecessary, minimise disturbance to the site during the works. Keeping the shared path is quite critical. It is, as I've said, a quite important um, thoroughfare for people, walkers or cyclists. Promoting visual amenities is obviously important. Protecting the shore edge, promoting revegetation to enhance the biodiversity values, um, which we can do using native vegetation. So they're the, 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 like the underlying principles behind the design concepts in, that we've developed. Design solution. Um, so obviously we need to create a stable bank. Um, laying back the banks to, to a stable slope and revegetating. This is the most cost effective way to stabilise a riverbank. Um, if we can use native plant species to promote plant diversity, that does a number of things for us. It enhances <coughs> the like plant effectiveness. What we're trying to do, put in by that is we're well, they're planting, we're trying to get a network, if you like, of roots like reinforcing through the soil. So we get the maximum benefit if we're using shrubs, um, grasses, ground covers, sedges, those lower strata species with the odd large tree. Like what we've got there at the moment is we've got large trees that are falling over and aren't providing that network of root systems through the soil. So that's what we're trying to do through our plant diversity and effectiveness from a, from a structural perspective. That also what it does for us is it provides increased habitat. And through those two things, we get increased and promotes biodiversity. Now, in some areas, we do need to use hard structures where there's insufficient space, if you like, to lay back the bank and keep the shared path. So we, there is one location where um, we just isn't room, room, if you like, to, um, to lay the banks back to the slopes we need and not have an impact on either some important um, significant trees or the path. So in those cases, we've used, um, in one only case actually, we've used a, a gaming uh, wall structure. That's why that's there. Um, we also need to provide a bit of additional protection at the water's edge to manage the wave wash so that the, the lake sits at a fairly constant level. 
And what you can get in that scenario is you know, continuous wave action occurring at a particular level on, on, the, on the lake edge. And so that will, well, in this case, the bank, that will over time create um, issues in terms of the bank. So we need to provide some harder protection in those areas. So this is um, a photo, again, looking from the, um, the Frome Street Bridge, looking, looking upstream. Um, and this is our, our works once they've been done, according to our, our landscape artist. So you can see here what we've done is a couple of features. If you look along the, the water's edge on the left there, you can see some rocks along the base. Uh, so these are, are loose rocks that are, that are keyed well into that, that what we call the toe of the bank. And that's providing that, that localised armouring at the water's edge so we don't get that wave wash action. You can also see that we've got uh, quite dense plantings. Uh, again, a lot of uh, sedges and grasses towards the base. And you can see because we've used a loose rock, not a, not a sort of a hard sort of concrete structure along the edge, um, we're getting vegetation that will come up through that, that rock, uh, rock structure at the base. As we move further up the bank, we're starting to get into higher strata forms of vegetation. So we're starting to get into, into the shrubs and we're starting to get further up to bottle brushes and acacias. Um, we're obviously trying to retain as many of the larger trees as we can. And so we still got that, that overarching view, if you like, the large eucalypts um, as, as the backdrop, um, which again supporting the, uh, the native uh, and natural vegetation processes we're trying to encourage in this site. Um, so that all looks great, but there are some construction challenges we need to be aware of. Um, obviously proximity to the shared path, so we need to actually uh, restrict access during the construction period and probably need to redirect the path, if you like, users out onto, um, not onto the or drive, but onto the footpath, if you like, on the drive. Tight access to steep banks, so it'll be tricky. The contractor will need to be very careful about the way they go about doing work. And because it's tight access, they'll be constrained in how much movement they've got. So that means the cost will be higher than what might be <coughs> in the case. It's also quite a big reach. We're reaching down about six or seven metres in some places. So we need, if the contractor will need to use um, some significant, if you like, um, excavators to do the work. Either that or they'll need to do it from, the, from a barge from the water's uh, edge. Um, as Tom has indicated, there are a significant number of exotic trees leaning over and falling over, and a number of those trees need to be removed. Um, so that adds another challenge within this area, as the previous tree that was removed there back in, um, in December needed a large crane to assist with that process. Um, the large indigenous trees are to be protected. Um, the council arborists did look at the, the site and identified some of the key trees. And so we've worked around those um, to save those. And, and particularly, as I mentioned, the, the gaming wall structure, which is towards the, the upstream end of the works area. The primary reason for that is, is one, to protect the, the to keep the shared path, but also there are two iron barks there, which are particularly important. So that, that's what they're, they're there for. And water quality. You know, we want to make sure that the contractor manages the site well, so we don't end up with water, if you like, in the, the torrents, um, and we don't end up with what I'd call snail trails, if you like, on War Memorial Drive. So it's important to be a high, it's in a high exposure area, and so it's important that, that the contractor uh, undertakes good best practice construction management techniques. So if we implement the design, these are the things that we think will, um, will be outcomes, if you like. So public safety will greatly be improved. Um, unfortunately, the 37 uh, non-Indigenous trees, some of those are native trees, but non-Indigenous, uh, will, will need to be removed. Um, there are no regulated or significant trees being removed. Uh, the Indigenous trees, as I mentioned, will be protected. We've got um, over well, 9,550 is, is the mass, if you add up all those, those sedges and, and grasses shrubs and, uh, and um, small strata trees such as the acacias. The shared path will be retained and enhanced in some areas and making it a little bit wider through one pitch point. And I guess the, the last thing there is about um, if we don't do anything then 8,000 tonnes of sediment over the life of the, the works if you like is going to just continually fall down in, into the lake. And so we're basically preventing through this artificial means if you like preventing the loss of sediment and displacement of sediment uh, into the into the waterfalls. If we don't do the works, then that that sediment. The, what what's effectively happening is the banks are naturally, if you like, laying themselves back. So they'll lay themselves back to to as, as flat a slope as they can. And the way in which we can um, steepen up that slope is, if you like, is armouring it through vegetation and through um, intervention, if you like, in that process. And that way, we're not actually letting that that sediment be released into the environment. 
So another photo here, this is a shot looking down further down towards where those iron darks are. And this is the section there. So the, the, the bit on the right there um, is the, the Gavian structure. So there are the, they're the, I guess, the, the nature of the works, the, the reason for the works. Um, if we um, proceed, and this is, I guess, stitching it back, if you like, to council's strategic <laughs> plan uh, in terms of the smart, livable, green and creative themes. So all these things are, are things that are in terms of enhancing biodiversity, improving ecological value, reducing pollution, embracing water sensitive urban design using a green infrastructure like approach to the problem, enhancing facilities, promoting recreational in terms of continued use of the shared path, and putting an infrastructure, if you like, that's being sensitive to the natural environment and obviously providing uh, public safety provisions. So. Thank you, Jeff, and, and thank you, Tom. Oh, do we have any questions? Just, yeah, just a quick one, uh, Chair. Sure, there is all right. Just a quick one. I was a bit confused by paragraph uh, 22, I think it is, about the costing. It, it says that uh, the design work is funded in 15 and 16, <coughs> no expense in 16 17, but then 1.03 in 17 18, or is it? 1.03 in 16-17 and again in 17-18. No, sorry, that is an error in uh, the report. The current allocation for funding is 1.03 million in 16-17 and that will be the final cost. Okay, yeah, it has to be done too. Councillor yeah. Clarahan. Yes, it's, um, I guess it's a much neglected area of the river and uh, it looks incredibly precarious and very unsafe in its current, stand, current state. My question is, um, will there be any access available uh, by the public or is it still going to be, even with the rolling back, it's, is it still going to be too steep? Um, the intent is that people wouldn't have direct access down to the water's edge. It will still be quite steep. Right. Um, but it'll obviously be a lot less steep than what it is now, but it's not, not a, a, um, a slope that we would uh, advise that people have uh, unfettered access. It would still be quite like, considerable. It would be, re yeah, and, and that, that's a balance between, um, you know, we can make it flatter, but then we're starting yeah. to encroach on the shared path and, and walk and walk and drive. So there just unfortunately isn't, isn't the space um, to do anything uh, flat. <laughs> Um, I, I have a question if other members have finished. Can we go to the image showing the artist impression? Thank you. Um, I, I note that there's an endeavour to sort of move away from exotic towards native trees. Um, the trees shown um, on the banks are uh, wattles and acacias, just small four five metre high trees there. Um, the Adelaide watercourses native vegetation is the Eucalyptus camaldulensis or the river red gum. Um, what, why are we not proposed to plant that whole bank with, with river red gums, which is the uh, Adelaide native um, watercourse tree. Through the chair. Um, Why can't we? <laughs> um, what we, what can we? we right. Um, a couple of things. The, it's important that we get a, a good blend of different vegetation and different strata. And what we find over the years in, in the work that I've been doing is that the, um, the, the river red gums, are, we will get a natural regeneration of river red gums. Um, so in the early, in my first years of um, stream rehabilitation, I went out and planted a lot of red gums and soon found out I had a lot of overcrowding of trees and you will get natural regeneration. So, so in this situation, we would, um, we're really trying to make sure we get those, those lower strata trees to get that root reinforcing in the soil occurring in the, the lower sections of the bank. And as we step up the bank, we're, we're certainly retaining some of the existing red gums up there. Uh, we will see that there will be a natural regeneration of, of, of red gums through this through this site. 
Um, it, it, uh, if, if council were of the view that um, you were wanting some additional plantings to be done, that that could be done. It's not that won't compromise the design if there is, um, you know, a, a smaller number of, um, of red gums introduced. But in reality, that's something that will, um, will look after itself in, in a fairly short period of time. So we we, we could ask that to be. So that, that certainly oh, at a spacing that yeah. makes sense for them to that wouldn't compromise the design, but again, yeah. we, we wouldn't we'd be wanting to have those back up near the path and not right down near, near the near the bottoms of the water edge. Why would you because they um, don't actually grow near the water course? So <laughs> well, again, what we're trying to do in this 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 situation is in, in a natural situation also what you do is you have the water is actually you know, a river system will, will break its banks quite often. And so you'll get water flowing out in the floodplain. So most of the time you see, or well, when you see a red gum uh, in a natural system, the actual the, the tree, if you like, is sitting back uh, on towards the top of the banks or on the floodplain. It's really, and you, you do get examples, but it's really is it sitting right in, in the main flow path. With this um, design, but the other facet we have to accommodate is the fact that it is, it does take a lot of water. It is basically got a, a large flood carrying capacity and it's providing a flood conveyance and flood protection service for the city of Adelaide. So, so it's important that we can provide that, continue to provide that service. So we don't really want to have large um, red gums, if you like, right down on the water's edge it, at a density, if you like, that might compromise the, um, the flood conveyance of, of the system. So, um, yes, yeah, so as I say, I think over time you'll see definitely, you'll see natural regeneration. So some of those trees will occur and they'll occur at different heights in the bank. Um, but certainly in terms of the design process, we could introduce some additional um, plantings in terms of red gums, but we would locate them more towards the top of the bank rather than down near the near the, the toe. I think I'd like to see if I'm left to chance and I'm <laughs> sure we do get some and that we get a few at least down close, if not yeah. that's, that's to get a more natural appearance. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> That brings us to the next item on the agenda, Councillor Martin, renewal. Sorry. 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 Right, okay, we've got a uh, recommendation for item seven. Do we have a mover, Councillor Hender, seconded by Councillor Martin? Councillor Hender. So all I want to do. <laughs> Nothing really to add other than to say uh, this work, this ongoing work along the riverbank is sensational work. The transformation along the riverbank is, has been remarkable and I just wanted to thank the staff involved in it because it's really doing a beautiful job and this is obviously extending that even further. Councillor Martin. Say it, Dito. Yeah, I just wanted to say the same. I think it's beautiful. I think it's an enhancement. It's so good to see more trees being planted and selection seems to be the right balance um, and in particular the native vegetation. So I think it's fantastic, especially with um, the new school that's going to go down that way too. I think safety is very important. Um, just before I hand back to you to sum up, just as, as chair, I would just flag when this comes to council, I'll be looking to to make an amendment to ensure that we do get some river red gums, not just wattles and acacias uh, actively planted as part of that scheme. But uh, to sum up, Number. all those in favour? Those opposed? Carried. Thank you. Now, item eight Councillor Martin, renewal of Love and Playground East. I'll be Are moving as. Part of the day. Moving as printed chair. Oh, sure. that, <coughs> Could you get a second up? You've got a second up? Councillor Clarahan? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I'll be very brief given the hour. Um, I uh, want to thank the administration for making available the detailed concept plans for us to approve before the public consultation. Um, it gives some comfort to be able to see all of the plans. I have just one question related to uh, a proposal, I think at, um, I can't remember the page number, but um, we suggest, oh, here it is, 24 and 41, that it's proposed to remove the fence along the back boundary of the playground so that the children can walk into the bush. 
Um, <laughs> now, well, that's part of the proposal. That is that they can have the natural experience as well as the playground experience. And that means not come back. Well, yes, that's possible. That's possible. Uh, um, and I just wonder whether that might be part of the public consultation because I would think that, you know, there is a perception among the parents that playgrounds are fenced areas in which children are afforded protection by the boundaries. Uh, so if this is to be a, a new concept, then I would ask that that's part of the consultation process. Yeah. Through the chair, we are doing that consultation with the public. Thank you. Councillor Corbell. Thank you. Look, I think this is a terrific project and um, thank you for all the hard work. I was at the APLA meeting and APLA were very pleased with, um, with the presentation that you provided as well. Although I do note that the feedback was um, very firmly that um, the entrance entryway, which is on page 51, we didn't want to see quite that much um, pavement and we wanted to see a reduction in um, the hard surface. So I, I support this and it going to consultation, but with a reduction, an assurance from the administration that there's a reduction. Perfect. Okay. Beautiful. 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 Uh, through the chair, there wasn't enough time to get the amendments into the agenda chart, so we brought them on the, the updated conference. Any yeah. further discussion? Question, Councillor Hanker, Deputy Again, thank you to staff for the beautiful work. Um, my question just relates to the budget. It indicates that we've got 425k in the current budget for, for 16, 17 for that year. Budget, what budget line does that come out of? Is that the renewal? I don't remember this coming to us as a project, is really what my question is. Um, through the chair, that is an asset renewal budget um, okay. that is set aside for playgrounds each year. Okay. How much, just incidentally, how much do we set aside for playgrounds each year? I can, through the chair, I can only answer for um, 16, 17, which was 500,000 and 75,000 is going to retrofacial works and other playgrounds. Okay, and if I can just make a comment about that. This, as someone who raised my children in the, in the square mile, this is a much, a very welcome, I didn't realise we spent that much money. And the, the playground work we've done to date, certainly since I've been on council, has been outstanding. The Benighton Park, Princess Elizabeth, and now this, uh, it's, a, it's really <coughs> um, a, this, uh, um, the city a destination for parents, and I think it's a wonderful thing. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question, if no one else has got questions. Oh, the Lord Mayor. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, okay. We did do a good look into this at Appler, and um, well done. It's a terrific project. Um, the, but I do have a genuine, genuine question, possibly to the CEO. But um, CEO, we are announcing many very, very exciting projects for the City of Adelaide for the 16-17 financial year and beyond. Uh, and I'm not expecting you to get a voluminous answer right now, but the, um, we've got Gordon Place, we've got Central Market to Riverbank, we've now got North Terrace as a consequence of today's wonderful announcement, we've got this great park and we've probably got a whole pile more projects. Um, do we have the capacity, I know we've got the financial capacity, do we have the capacity in terms of resources to deliver these projects here? Through the chair, we've got a new director um, that's going to deliver everything for us, so, so we're good. We're good. Well done, Sydney. No pressure. Oh, wow. That was a good pass the back, wasn't it? I couldn't be to say that. Um, I just have a, a comment and, 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 and a question. I'm pleased to see the um, emphasis that's been put on the historic mm -hmm. building. The terminal vista to the, to the main entrance. But um, uh, if you look at the early photographs, one can see that the paving that was originally there, as throughout the parklands, is a long sand coloured paving, not a black asphalt. I think we need to do some looking into producing a blonde asphalt so that we can, for all of our <coughs> parkland paths, footpath, bitumen footpaths, so that we're not just propagating black bitumen um, 
It'd be nice if we could do that before this project actually happens so that all of that hard stand could be a blonde bitumen that replicates the appearance of the, um, the um, sand gravel that is historically what existed throughout the Adelaide Park lands. Um, thank you. And through the chair, we are able to explore that before the process gets in Thank you. I'll hand that back to the mover to sum up. Summed up. All those in favour? All those opposed? Carried. Thank you, Councillor Martin. And we come back straight back to you, Councillor Martin, for item 10, Reconciliation Plaza, ongoing management. Uh, I'll be moving it as printed. We have a seconder. Councillor Moran as mover. Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, look, I, I just want to say that um, we can see that we had a problem in Hindley Street and we removed the problem. Uh, and here, I, um, I asked the rhetorical question, why, why do we persist? It is clear from the paper and the options at paragraph 26 that we are just making a decision to manage uh, the problem, allowing the speed to creep up by five kilometres an hour. But it's also clear that um, th there's no uh, skid performance standard to be able to judge whether that's going to work or not. So we're just going to look at it and we're going to clean the roadway every two weeks. We're going to replace the signs, change the speed limit up to thirty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. At some stage, uh, I, I would suggest uh, to Council that we actually need to think about doing something other than managing the problem. That is fixing it permanently with a surface that is not going to create uh, hazards of the kind we saw in um, uh, the pictures of the bus sliding across the square in recent times. Uh, so I just ask that um, the administration contemplate the possibility that there might be an appetite amongst some of us at least to just fix it instead of constantly dealing with it. Thank you, Councillor. Second it. Councillor Moran? Fine. Lord Mayor. Thanks, Chair. I have to support that sentiment, um, that I'm very happy to accept this as now, but I, it does beg the question, what if this strategy does not work? And that would then surely require another strategy. So, but I must say, just a, a comment, which I'm hoping the administration can take on good faith, is that the, um, uh, the line marking uh, and I understand that line marking is probably not the correct term because uh, painted line marking that surface does not work, um, is very difficult in order to sometimes navigate what lane you are actually in, especially when you're heading in, let's say, a uh, westerly direction coming from King William Street, turning right into Reconciliation Plaza. Um, and I think setting aside the surfacing chair, but the discussion around just ensuring the safety of motorists so they have some certainty about what lane they're actually in. I'm, I'm hoping that could be rectified in time. And uh, in tune with that is the line marking around the entire uh, eastern perimeter of Victoria Square is pretty ordinary. And you really notice it in the wet weather time. <coughs> and you see drivers just not knowing where they are or what lane they're in. So I think that's something from a safety perspective, whether it's cat's eyes or whatever they're going to use on the road. Um, but we're really going to have to look at that to improve it because I think we've got an, actually a greater safety issue other than that surfacing. But my, my, my statement is, Chair, that should this strategy not prove successful, we will surely have to adopt another one and we should act swiftly if we have even the slightest um, uh, evidence that this strategy is insufficient. So we ask the CEO perhaps to take on more suggestions about the line marking on that. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Councillor Corbell. Uh, yeah, look, I'm supportive of this. I think it's good to reduce the speed limit in this area. People are naturally doing going up. There's still a lot. Uh, well, you know, as in, yeah. Permanently. Um, yeah, and so there's a need for safety. Um, so safety has to be paramount. But I can see for that whole area around the square, um, it, it's going to be a good thing. And also just on, on the line markings, I also find it very difficult. And I'm sure lots of other people do, especially in the wet weather and at night time. It can be really quite confusing. Um, for somebody who's who uses that space on a regular basis, let alone somebody that's unfamiliar with with um, accessing it. Oh, to respond to that. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I guess just in regard to those couple of questions on line marking, um, we have acknowledged that and uh, the report does talk to some changes that we've uh, applied on the turning to the square. Um, we're actually providing a, a, a black um, background to the white line marking to try and improve that. Uh, but in addition to that, we're also just reviewing our specifications for line marking uh, within Council uh, to ensure we get a, a better quality product um, on our roads throughout the city. Councillor Moran and Councillor Clarahan. You might have already answered it, but that bit's dangerous too. But the on the outside state admin and the SA water building, when it's wet or dark, the old lines show up. Um, yeah, they're, they're just yeah. indistinguishable from um, the new lines. So wet and dark, you've really got a problem there. Can we rough, is there some way we can make the old lines not shiny? Um, through you, Chair, that, that is a common problem. Um, I, I guess we have uh, some asset renewal um, around the square. We'll be resurfacing some of those roads that you're talking about. Um, and certainly at that point in time, we'll be applying new line marking and you won't have that problem. Um, but we'll certainly see what we can do to address the immediate. Because it's so. not that you can't see them, it's just you can see too many of them. Councillor Clare, do you have a question? Uh, for someone who actually did a right hand turn into the centre of the square and took the bus lane, I've never been back since. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that too. Maybe we should encourage more people to do the same. Don't change the light. No, I do. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask about the signage that we will put up there um, in terms of the 30 mile a kilometre limit now. What sort of signage will it be? Yeah, it's uh, basically what's through the chair, sorry. Uh, basically what we've got there at the moment is uh, slippery and wet signage and the 25 kilometre an hour signage. So we'll replace the 25s with 30 um, standard signage. Um, but more importantly, the, the major cost is associated with the um, variable message boards. That will be located on either end uh, on the approach to the square. So, oh, we'll uh, re we, we, through the chair, we'll be retaining those. Uh, we'll be getting uh, rid of the temporary trailer mounted um, message boards that we've got at the moment, which, uh, which aren't particularly attractive. So, we want to uh, put in a permanent solution which we will be pole mounted um, in line with the uh, DP uh, recommended guidelines. For Electronics on. Yeah. I just wondered whether any of them have the ability to tell people how fast they're going. I think having gone through a few of those over the last few months, nothing pulls you up faster than knowing that you're actually exceeding the limit and it shows you, tells you to slow down. Yes, through the chair, I just comment on that. We applied uh, the same techniques in, uh, in Hindley Street um, and uh, we'll certainly consider that as part of our, one of our management options if speeds uh, don't decrease to a level which we think is satisfactory. Lord Mayor. Sorry for the additional uh, question, Chair. Um, Mr Burton, the illuminated signs which you'll put up, they will be a council-owned asset. They won't be a rented. They're not like this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm with you. Any further comments? And I'll go back to the mover. How's the margin? Summed up. All those in favour? All those opposed? Carry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Items for committee to receive a note to nil. Out of session papers, the committee to receive a note, nil. Other business? Members. Deputy Lord Mayor, Hender. I've got a motion without notice, I'm sorry I haven't had an opportunity to, um, to circulate it, so if I could just uh, read it out. It's recommending that Council 1 engage with the Riverbank Authority to, as to the level of facilities and public infrastructure within the new plaza development with a view to maximising its effectiveness of the public space. And two, Engage with the Festival Centre as to design, integration, infrastructure issues associated with the Festival Centre redevelopment and in particular its interface with the Old Park. If I can do a second after that. Bell. So just very um, briefly, we've had uh, had some a number of us, or some of us have had some discussions today um, in relation to the Riverbank, um, uh, sorry, in relation to the Plaza redevelopment which is being run by um, by the Riverbank Authority, although it's alongside the Festival Centre, it's being run by the Riverbank Authority. And um, so a number of people have expressed some concerns that there, there may not be adequate public facilities there. So, for example, public lavatories and um, um, you know, water, um, drinking water facilities and things like that to make it a, a, a highly usable public space. Now, that, that might be scuttlebutt, but I, I just think we need to check on that. And if that is the case, to give some feedback to the Riverbank Authority about 
from our experience of what's required in public spaces to make them work well um, and plug and play facilities and those sorts of things the things that we learned in the mall that you know we know um, will make make spaces work so that's item one item two relates to the festival centre so while the state government through the riverbank authority is looking after the redevelopment of the plaza the festival centre itself is redeveloping the festival centre and turning its face to the river and they're very keen to engage with us um, so that we, we coordinate activities, particularly in the interface between the Festival Centre and Elder Park. So um, this, is, this motion is designed to achieve both those things, just to get us talking to those people who are doing work on that bit of our city to make sure that we're across all the detail and that we have some uh, input into it to make sure that it's okay. I need to declare a conflict, so I'll just remove myself. Gosh, of course you do. And you do a reason for the conflict, I'm for the record. The board of the festivals and thank you, Centre. So we're I'm running. Going to the <laughs> thank you. Councillor Clara Hand, have you finished? Yeah, I've got nothing to add. That's yeah. Um, so it's yeah, a fairly simple simple process. Um, yeah, I just I think I, I support this. I think communication is very, very important, and engaging closely with the Bank Authority um, on some of these aspects that Councillor Objection or Mayor has um, touched on, I think, is very, very important. And our staff, um, our administration team, they have a lot of knowledge and um, a lot of quality and valuable feedback and input that they can provide. Um, and obviously we represent as elected members the ratepayers of the city. Of course, um, a lot of our residents and businesses are going to be affected by this and we have a long term interest in this. So we should be engaging with them um, right now as, you know, as this project is um, unfolding in terms of its development and concept plans and the implementation of it. So I think it's very, very important. And um, I think it's also very important to engage together with the Festival Centre in engaging with the River Bank Authority because we're all key stakeholders. Any other members? Deputy Lord Mayor. Just a question. Um, I certainly support what the Deputy Lord Mayor has put up here, but is there a um, is there a potential budget implication whatsoever, CEO, with regards to this motion? Look, I think at this time through you, Chair, I think it's quite okay. Um, if there's any budgetary implications, we'd report back to Council. So I'm happy to take it at this time. Thank you. Any further discussion? Back to you, Mr. Summer. Yeah, just to let you know, there's not my intent that we spend any dough on this. It's just that we, we get down there and start the conversation to make sure that we know what's going on, they know what's going on, and that we have an input to the extent that we can add value to the projects. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I now put that. Those in favour? Those opposed? Carried. Thank you. Do we have any other, other business? Motions without notice? No? Thank you. Now, item seeking exclusion to the public. Exclusion to consider. Item 16, Tennis SA Parklands Lease, Tartania Wama and <coughs> Kawidi Park One. Have a mover. Councillor Martin, second Councillor Moran. All those in favour? All those opposed? Thank you. Second one, item 17, the Pavilion Parklands Lease, Walu Yata. Move Councillor Corbell, seconded Councillor Moran. All those in favour? That's for the exclusion. All those opposed? That's carried. I now ask all um, members of the public and staff not as directly associated with these two matters to uh, exit the room.
I'm asking the doors to be reopened. Nine twenty-eight. I close. Thank you. Council, um, we were planning to have a bit of a conversation about um, sponsorship. We might do that over dinner. Everyone's okay with that? I'll just reshoot.